Chapter 14. Feast, Fun, and Death. In answer to a question submitted to the website, Anonymous says. As to the even culture, they had a form of musical entertainment. The music sounded like tonal rhythms. They also listened to a type of chanting. The Ebens were dancers. They celebrated certain work periods with a ritual dance. The Ebens would form a circle and dance around, listening to the chanting type of music. The music was played on bells and drums, or something similar to them. From the commander, we learn more about how Ebens have fun. We had a feast today. What a feast! We used our last sea rations, but the Ebens didn't really care for our food. We did kill a beast. As I mentioned before, the Ebens allowed us to kill the beasts for meat. The meat isn't really bad, 899 says it tastes like bear, which I never ate. But Ebens look at us very strangely when we eat meat. Strange, they can clone creatures, and other species of humans, but they can't eat meat. How strange they are. But they allow us to do just about anything we want. We use the last of our salt and pepper, which does make eating their food more of a challenge. The Ebens don't have anything similar to salt and pepper. They do have an herb, as we call it, something like oregano, which they use. It has a tart taste, but we have developed a taste for it. The feast was great. We participated in the dances, which the Ebens really like. They get great pleasure dancing and playing their strange games. I described the games before, but at this feast, we saw something different. The game was played like chess, but with Eben standing on a large square area of the compound. The squares were divided into 24 sets. Each set had another two spots. Just how or why the Ebens moved was a mystery to us. One of the Ebens would say a word, and then another would move. It appeared that it was a team game. Six Ebens on each side. We couldn't figure it out, but at the end, the Ebens danced with each other, signifying a victory, we think. It was a fun day. And more from Anonymous. Our team brought along softball equipment for sporting activity. The Ebens would watch the game and laugh out loud. Their laugh sounded like a high-pitched yell. Eventually, the Ebens started playing the game but never got used to catching the ball before it hit the ground. Our team also played touch football. Again, the Ebens watched the game intensely, and then played it themselves. But again, like softball, the Ebens never figured out they had to catch the football before it hit the ground. Although our team members honored the privacy of the Ebens, our team was allowed to witness births. Our team, snooping around, was able to capture the sexual activity of the Ebens. The males and females had similar sexual organs, and performed intercourse. The frequency of sexual activity was not recorded as being as often as in our society. It was believed that they performed the act for pleasure, and reproduction. The team commander continues his narration about the feast day. My team played softball with some hard-nosed Evans, who have learned the game. Well for the most part. They still haven't figured out they have to catch the ball before it hits the ground. But they had fun. We have found some extremely gifted athletes among the Ebens. Then again, we found some who had no athletic ability. Just like humans. Our softball game ended when the rain came. We ended up inside the community building. We finished our meals, and went to our living area. As we do each day, we have our end of day briefing. We check each other for psychological condition and medical health. Our day ends and we start our 8 hours of rest. Ebens have a different period of time, as I mentioned before. They rest about 4 hours, for every 10 hours working time. But we must consider that their hour is longer, and that their days are longer. So we stopped using our time and use the Eben time. It is difficult to understand, but this is only a diary. Once I return to Earth, I can explain the time difference, and how we had to use their time instead of ours. I keep writing about the time in every diary entry, but it is important to note that even though we have been here for about three years, Earth time, we have given up Earth time and utilized the Eben time. We tried to use their two suns as a counting system, but that didn't work. We then tried to use our own watches, but that didn't work. 
so we gave up our timepieces, and just use the Evans Time Tower. Each village has one, and it is easy to understand the symbols. Each symbol means a certain time. And certain work period. The time situation was complex, because it related to the way Serpo revolves around Zeta Reticuli 1, while influenced by Zeta Reticuli 2. Here is what Anonymous says about the time problem. Our scientists had the same questions, as posed by your audience. Our scientists questioned our team members, and the information they gathered. Our scientists could not understand how the orbit of Serpo could revolve around the two suns at the distance measured. In the end, our scientists found that some things relating to that particular system were different in terms of physics, compared to our system. There were some questions about how our team measured the orbit, and other calculations based on the lack of a stable time base. For some reason, and I don't think this was ever determined, our time instruments did not work on Serpo. Now, considering this, you can understand the difficult job our team members had making calculations without time. They had to come up with an alternate method to measure speeds, orbits, and so on. Challenge, try solving a problem in physics without being able to measure time on Earth. So you see, our team did the best they could with the instruments they had, and the hardships they developed attempting to make scientific calculations. It is difficult for any Earth-based scientist to understand the different physics in other solar systems or on other planets. One of the questions sent to me involved Kepler's law of planetary motion. Our team had that information. We had some of the best military scientists on the team. But if you consider Kepler's law, it requires time, and our team could only measure time in the conventional way. It was determined that Kepler's laws did not apply to that solar system. Conclusion One of the things our Earth-based scientists learned was not to apply Earth's laws of physics in a universal way. Anonymous says further on this subject. Regarding time, the team members brought several timepieces, such as wristwatches, non-battery style, as it stated in the debriefing data. The timepieces worked, but they had no reference to time since the even days were longer, the dusk and dawn periods were longer and they had no calendars to reference. They did use the timepieces to calculate movement, for example, timing the movement of the Eben's two suns. They also calculated the time between work and rest periods. But, after a while, the team discarded their timepieces, and used the Eben's measurement of time periods. The team became confused with the calendars they brought, a 10-year calendar. After 24 months, the team lost track of time, as to the calendar since they could not properly calculate days compared to Earth days. They set up one large clock to the Earth time when they left. However, this was a battery-controlled clock, and when the battery died, the clock stopped, and they forgot to change the battery in time. Consequently, they lost the Earth time. The team brought a large quantity of batteries, but they ran out after about five years. The Ebens had no comparable item like batteries. Noted Cornell astronomer Carl Sagan was consulted about the planetary motion of Serpo that contributed to the timing difficulties. About this consultation, Anonymous says. One of the principal home-based astronomers that was contracted to assist us was Dr. Carl Edward Sagan. Initially, he was the biggest skeptic of the group. But as information was slowly analyzed, Dr. Sagan came back to the middle. I can't say he fully accepted every single piece of data, but he did agree on the final report. Email moderator Victor Martinez supplied the following fast facts about Carl Sagan's involvement in the program, on the website. Born in Brooklyn, New York, on November 9, 1934, and died in Seattle, Washington, on December 20, 1996 of bone marrow cancer. He was an American astronomer, educator, and planetary scientist and was the director of the Laboratory for Planetary Studies at Cornell University. Project Serpo's final report was written in 1980 with Dr. Sagan having been brought in halfway through the project. It is believed that he wrote his 1985 bestseller, Contact, based on his insider knowledge of the most secret project in human history, a human-alien exchange program of which he signed off on its final report. Years later, his book was made into the 1997 movie, Contact, starring Jodie Foster. Sagan became well known as a result of his public debate in 1969 with Dr. J. Allen Hynek, sponsored by the American Association for the Advancement of Science, 
about whether or not UFO investigation should be considered serious science. Sagan argued that it was pseudoscience, and he was proclaimed the winner. He was brought in as a consultant on the Serpo project about a year later, when he then had to, of course, reconsider his skepticism. Sagan also locked horns on the same issue with well-known scientist and UFO investigator Stanton Friedman, his classmate in physics at the University of Chicago in the 1950s. But, even long after his involvement with the Serpo program in 1980, when he wrote a section of the final report, he was still able to say, in his bestseller Cosmos, published in 1985, We maintain that there is no credible evidence for the Earth being visited, now or ever. We now know posthumously that Sagan really wasn't two-faced about the extraterrestrial question. He had to be skeptical about UFOs in public, so as not to jeopardize his position in the astronomy department at Cornell, where he could not afford to appear to be unprofessional. Cornell relied heavily on government funding for its astronomy research, especially from NASA, and this could have been terminated had his real beliefs been revealed. In reality, Sagan was a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, and it is believed that he may even have been a member of Majestic 12. His true interest in extraterrestrials was revealed in his blockbuster book, Contact, later made into a hit movie in 1997, starring Jodie Foster and Matthew McConaughey. Sagan was a man of many talents. He won the Pulitzer Prize for Nonfiction in 1978 for his book, The Dragons of Eden. He has been immortalized in downtown Ithaca, New York, the home of Cornell, with the Sagan Memorial Walk of Planets. Ironically, in the end, it was he, more than anyone else, who raised the public consciousness all over the world about the possibility of life on the billions and billions of other worlds. But he did it his way. In terms of public perception, he had to walk a narrow path. But he navigated it successfully, and his continued fame is well deserved. The team commander's diary entry continues. EB2 came by after the feast. She was concerned with 754. As I mentioned in one past entry, 754 became sick. But he has recovered. We don't know what he suffered, but 700 treated him with penicillin, which worked. We all have had some sort of sickness, since we've been here except 899, that guy is a solid rock. He hasn't been sick, not even a cold. 706, 700, and 754 are keeping detailed records of each team member, and their medical and physical condition. We have tried to keep a steady physical fitness program since we arrived. Sometimes we follow it, and sometimes we don't. But everyone is in pretty good shape, at least physically. Mentally, that might be another story. Some team members miss Earth, as I do. But no team member has broken down, or has needed any type of psychological help from 700 or 754. Our screening process was great. Keeping busy is our medicine. We keep extremely busy, exploring and doing our mission goals. This diary entry by the commander was made about three Earth years into the visit. Shortly thereafter, two of the team members he mentions died. The security man, 899, was the first to die on Serpo. Evidently, his death occurred suddenly sometime after this diary entry was made, wherein, ironically, the commander had said that he was a solid rock, and he hasn't been sick, not even a cold. Anonymous gives a complete narration about the death of 899, and the attempt to revive him by the Eben doctors. The Ebens transported the team member's body to a remote area of the largest community. They took the body into a large building, apparently their hospital or medical center. The Ebens used a large examination table to view the body. They ran a large bluish-green light beam over the body. The Ebens watched a display that appeared on a large screen that looked like a television screen. The readouts were in the Eben written language, and thus our team could not understand it. However, there was a graphic display, similar to a heartbeat graph. The solid line was not wavering. Our doctors understood that meant the same thing that their equipment measured, the heart was not beating. The Ebens administered some liquid through a needle. This was done several times. Eventually, the heart started beating but our doctors knew the internal organs of the body were damaged, but couldn't fully explain that to the Ebens. They finally made a sign, placing both their hands to the chest and bowing their heads. 
our team members knew that meant the body was dead, and nothing could be done. The Ebens showed affection to our team. During the last work period, the Ebens had a ceremony for the dead team member, the same ceremony used when an Eben died. Our team held their own service, attended by the Ebens. The Ebens were extremely curious about our religious service. One team member, who was acting as a minister, performed a death service. Our team was eternally grateful for the Ebens' caring attitude for our dead friend. The second death also occurred sometime shortly after the above diary entry about the feast was made by the commander. One of the doctors died of pneumonia. We know he was alive at the time that diary entry was recorded, because both doctors are mentioned. It would be fair to conclude that it was 754 who died, since we learn in that entry that he had been sick, and treated with penicillin by 700, the other doctor. Interestingly, it was EB2 who first noticed, after the feast, that 754 was sick, and she was concerned about him. It is not surprising to find widespread and standardized religious observance in a police state, as in Mussolini's Italy. It is actually expected, because it is usually encouraged by the ruling authority. After all, it is easier to keep citizens in line when they believe that the social rules and regulations come from some sort of supreme being. The fact that all the Ebens were required to attend worship services every day at a designated time leads us to believe that this was another form of control by the ruling class, especially since it was uniform throughout the planet. Where there is freedom of belief, divergent opinions would be expected. From the following remarks by Anonymous, we learn about Eben religious customs. All of this information was taken from the debriefing document. Ebens did die. Our team members saw deaths, some from accidents, and some from natural causes. The Ebens buried the bodies, similar to our method. Our team saw two air accidents involving their intraplanet flying vehicle. The Ebens worshipped a supreme being. It appeared to be some sort of deity relating to the universe. They conducted daily services, normally at the end of the first work period. They had a building or church they entered to worship. Our team witnessed an aircraft accident that killed four Ebens. The Ebens performed a form of ritual at the crash site. They transported the bodies to a medical facility and examined the bodies. Our team members were always allowed to accompany the Ebens, except during rest period, when the Ebens closed their doors for privacy. Our team members saw the sorrow in the eyes of the Ebens during the death of their own. Later, after the last work period of the day, the Ebens had a funeral, at least that is what our team concluded it was. The Eben bodies were wrapped in a white cloth. Several types of liquids were poured over the bodies. Large numbers of Ebens would stand in a circle, chanting. The sounds became almost nauseating to our team members. The ceremony lasted for a long time. Finally, the bodies were placed in metal containers, and buried in a remote location away from the communities. After the burial, the Ebens had a feast. Large tables of food were brought out, and everyone ate, danced, and played games. This occurred at every Eben death witnessed by our team. From the foregoing comments by Anonymous, we learn that the concept that death is a joyous release of the soul from the cares of physical existence, may well be a galaxy-wide belief. Anonymous tells us about their great war. Perhaps George Lucas knew about this piece of Eben history when he wrote Star Wars. Many hundreds of thousands of Ebens died in the Great War. The Ebens fought a battle with an enemy for a period of time. Our team members estimated the war lasted about 100 years, but, again, that is our time. The war was fought using particle beam weapons, developed by both civilizations. The Ebens eventually were able to destroy the enemy planet, killing the remaining enemy forces. They did warn us that several other alien races within our galaxy were hostile. The Ebens stay away from those races. The debriefing document never stated the name of the enemy, probably because they no longer existed. This information helps us to understand why the Eben military was so strong and dominant. Evidently, the aftermath of their great war left the populace traumatized, and very willing to accept continuing military authority.